I'm Dr. Scott Lyons, and you're watching or listening to The Gently Used Human. In the world of comedy, where laughter is both a currency and a weapon, navigating the complexities of identity, perception, and creative expression can be a delicate dance. Today, I am joined by the multi-talented Joel Kim Booster, a rising star in the industry whose work has not only entertained audiences, but also challenged assumptions and pushed a hell of a lot of boundaries. From his breakout role in the critically acclaimed film Fire Island to his Emmy-nominated writing and acting, Joel has carved out a space for himself as a voice that refuses to be confined by labels and expectations. In this conversation, we'll delve into the challenge of perception and assumptions in the comedy industry, exploring how Joel has navigated the evolution of his stand-up persona and the struggle to balance authenticity with the demands of the audience. We'll also explore the boundaries of comedy itself, examining the shifting landscape of the industry and the ongoing discourse around identity, comedy, and the representation of marginalized communities. Joel will share his thoughts on the concept of punching up versus punching down, and we'll reflect on the exhaustion that can come with the constant deconstruction of identity and the desire for creative freedom. Y'all, this guy is such a sweetheart, and this conversation isn't just about comedy, it's about the human experience, the complexities of public perception and the pursuit of authentic self-expression. So join us as we delve into the nuances of representation and diversity and insecurities and forging a life in the public eye. This is one hell of an episode. Let's get it started. Joel, welcome to the Gently Used Human Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. I have watched a lot of your sp comedy specials. I It's it's always a really fun experience to go from watching you to meeting you. Yeah. And I have to say, unlike most celebrities I've met, you're not an asshole. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> um, that makes me feel good. I Yeah, no, I try. I think I'm hyper aware of it now, but I it is funny, like... I will see sometimes online, somebody said recently online about me that they knew me in Chicago and mm. I was the meanest gay guy they had ever met. Congratulations. Um, I know. I was like, what a what an honor because <laughs> we're, we're uh, pretty mean people. Yeah, um, but, Chicago's um, ruthless. I, I, I don't remember meeting this person ever in my entire life. And I... I find it hard to believe that I was ever the meanest gay person, especially back then yeah. when I was in my early 20s when I had just no self-confidence at all oh. to be mean. So I don't know what was going on back then, but that kind of stuff when I see it online is the stuff that really does get under my skin because it's so funny. Like whenever somebody's like super hyperbolic or like when it's coming from the right, like mm -hmm. the racism and the homophobia, yeah. like all of that shit, you know, slides right off. I yeah. don't absorb any of it. Yeah. But then like when people say stuff like that, I'm always like, what? And I, I think about it. I mean, I'm still thinking about it. I saw that tweet uh, w many, many moons ago and I am, it still like haunts me to oh this God. day. I'm like, I, I cannot stand the idea of someone being out there thinking that I'm the meanest person they've ever met. Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, it is, that is the weirdest thing about being I don't mean to shock you, but we did bring them as a, in as a guest today and we're <laughs> here to do repair to, no, work. Honestly, I would love to we sit should. down with that person and talk to them and figure out what happened yeah. because I am so deeply confused by it. Really, like out of all, and I've seen some fucked up tweets yeah. and I'm I'm so sorry for that. Like it breaks my heart yeah. to like see shit like that. But this really, yeah, I, I it really it it bothers me because the thing that I struggle with the most is not letting people online tell me who I am. Mm. Um, and I think that is the weirdest part about, you know, success in this industry. And, and the more you're in front of people, the more uh, you realize how quickly people are to sort of decide who you are based mm. on one interview or one tweet or one stand-up special or something like that. And it's this foric experience because obviously I am in my, my body and I, yeah. and my, my experience is like very holistic. I, I have, you know, a lot of sides to me. And then I remember that my stand-up persona is like such a blown out version of about 20% of who I am. And yeah. if that's the only idea of me that you have, then yeah, I guess, you know, you'd make some wild assumptions about me as a person, but was, it's yeah. was psychosexual a character like you're. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. all my stand up is a character. Yeah, to some degree, I think. Um, and there've been different iterations of it. 
over the, you know, 11, 12 years that I've been doing stand up. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually find a lot of people are really disappointed when they meet me <laughs> um, because I am a much less intense person. I'm yeah. actually like fairly introverted and a little shy yeah. when you first meet me. In fact, like my boyfriend's friends all thought I was like very cold and like a little, they just had this impression of me. I think because they were all, they all knew me as a stand up and they knew that guy. And then yeah. when I don't show up to the party immediately being that guy, yeah. people assume it's because I'm in a bad mood or I don't like them or I think I'm, you know, I'm arrogant or something like that. Yeah. And it is, I'm just like very, I, I can be a little socially awkward and shy and uh, I'm just not that high energy as a person. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I think people tend to make a lot of assumptions based on that, but it's weird. It's just the weirdest thing. Cause you do want to control how people see you yeah. and like, you just can't, yeah. not in this industry and yeah so that is the thing that i think that's what i struggle with that's what i talk to my therapist the most about yeah, tell me about your therapist <laughs> <laughs> we uh, also brought them in today yeah, thank god <laughs> um yeah no i actually i so yeah. i've had a couple of really great therapists over the years but mm -hmm. i i over the last year have been seeing a gay asian therapist mm -hmm. a man and he uh it is the best thing i have ever done for myself because wow. it is nice to come in finally and like especially starting off new with a new therapist, yeah. there was just so much I didn't have to go over with him. Yeah. There was just so much baseline he understood about my life and my experience yeah. that it, it felt like I was cheating. It felt like I was just, <laughs> I was like skipping ahead many yeah. chapters in our relationship. And so it's just nice to have someone who sees you very clearly from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, and so you can sort of skip ahead and get into some of like the real, the real uh, shit. Of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, when you said like, you know, not really, it's, it's manufactured. It's, it's, or it's a hyperbolic version mm -hmm. of the 20% of you. Yeah. Does it ever get confusing as to who you then are when you're playing these different versions of yourself for um, like your job? Essentially? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, um, it's never like, confusing are you? to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, yeah. it's never confusing to me. Yeah. I get why it would be confusing to people on the outside yeah, for sure. But I think, um, for me, it's just easier to compartmentalize and sort of segment myself off in different aspects of my work. Yeah. And yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of form of self-protection too, sure. I think. It would be an interesting experiment. And I'm sort of at a crossroads right now as a standup, as I try to figure out what the next iteration is and what mm. the new POV is going to be. It would be an interesting experiment to go out on stage and just be myself for once. <laughs> Uh, but I don't know. If I'm, I don't like? know if I'm ready for that. I think it would be highly. It would be pretty boring because <laughs> um, a lot of my standup it is about yeah. like hyperbole. Yeah. Like I, you know, I'm going out on stage right now, and I have like 10 minutes on how much I hate birds, and I don't actually feel that strongly about birds. But yeah. it is my like lukewarm feelings about birds is not an interesting place to yeah. come from comedically. You have yeah, yeah. to go to the extremes in some regard, yeah. and like you know, have come out and, and have a, a take that is like very, you know, hyperbolic. It's more, it's funnier, you know, it's yeah. funnier to just like come out and say full stop, birds are bad and <laughs> um, haughty and high strung and arrogant. Um, you have to have some sort of take on stuff. But yeah, I just don't feel that strongly about <laughs> a lot of <laughs> the things that I talk about on stage, but I, you know, pretend to for yeah. comedic effect. I feel for you because like there's, I think we, imagine that most comedians are coming out and actually saying the truth or their right, truth, yeah. as opposed to like a version of a truth that makes you laugh. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like I used to work as a drag queen in my twenties. <laughs> it's how I got myself through grad school and I was subversive as shit. Yeah. And um, I would go have dinner with like producers of shows afterwards and I wouldn't say a word because I was just so quiet. And they were like, did we do something wrong? Mm -hmm. But so I have that I have that similar experience, but no one ever imagined I was as subversive right. in my real life as I the shit I would say on stage yeah. or do. But with a comedian, it's it's almost like we just imagine they're revealing, they're opening a window into their house mm -hmm. and we're looking through. <laughs> right. And they're shouting back. <laughs> yeah. And I do think there were moments in my career, probably earlier on, like right yeah. around the time of my like probably my first Comedy Central special, it was probably a little bit closer to because I was talking about a lot more personal things like yeah. my family and my upbringing and stuff like that. And that is certainly 
a closer, probably was a closer approximation of who I was yeah. back then. But I just, uh, I find it's a l- little bit easier for me to compartmentalize, like I said, yeah. And, yeah. and go out and, and just be a character rather than uh, myself. It's just exhausting. That like level of, um, you know, radical transparency is not something <laughs> that uh, I'm super interested in it anymore, no. <laughs> no. especially as more eyes are on it. Interesting. I find it um, to be a little more stressful to be some, you know, naked, authentic version of myself. Yeah. I want to protect that a little yeah. bit more. And yeah, it just, it's like, it's a, it's how much are you, of yourself are you willing to give away yeah. to strangers, yeah. you know, six nights a week. Yeah. And I'm just, the older I get, less willing to do that. I appreciate so. your boundary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting in this age of like, Everything has to be authentic. Mm-hmm. I know it's authenticity. Radical this. authenticity. It's radical yeah, authenticity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, actually, that's pretty fucking tiring. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in different, many different folks have had to do different versions of code switching for mm-hmm. most of their life. And authenticity isn't as clean as we might think. Yeah. Has that been your experience? Yeah. I think um, I used to be very like open about, you know, my vulnerabilities and my insecurities around. Mm-hmm sex and dating and um, self-esteem issues and things like that. And it was, that was like early, like when I was really starting out, I would go on stage and be like, I feel like shit. I hate myself Mm -hmm. and I'm, uh, you know, undesirable. And that was like, especially as an Asian male comedian at the time, I think that was like pretty par for the course is like sort of playing that, that up and playing the clown a little bit and uh-huh. then it just started to feel bad and it started i just like was internalizing it a lot like focusing yeah. so much on the things about myself that i didn't like just like night after night like it, yeah. you really it, you do internalize a lot of it yeah. and um and it, and it just like was affecting my actual like real life um mm. and so that's when i like eventually started to pivot and doing this like character uh that was like i'm hot and dumb <laughs> um and it's interesting because I think like the I'm hot part of it, yeah. um, I get a lot of shit for that now. But back then, like when I was first starting to do that, I didn't believe it about myself. Sure. And I sort of like reverse engineered self-confidence through that character because I would go on stage and I would say that and I would do jokes about that from that perspective. And it did start to sort of, again, like the reverse of the yeah. older material, I was I was internalizing it. Wow. And I do think that there was an aspect of it back then before I looked like this now i think people sort of the part of the joke was i would go out on stage and say like i'm the hottest person in this room and people would laugh because i think the a part of them was like oh it's funny that this asian guy thinks that he's hot Mm. um and you know that was like a different sort of mind fuck for me for a while when i realized that was kind of what was happening and then you know i do now look like this and it's sort of like i can't for those who are listening yeah uh, this, this is, is hot yeah pod is a hot podcasting hot, is hot, a hot. visual medium um <laughs> but no i just felt a lot i started feeling a lot better about myself and doing you know uh things to take care of myself and i think yeah. um you know it's 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 sort of gauche and like tacky to now be, now that you're hot that. you can't actually yeah say yeah, yeah exactly I'm, it was like i'm sorry f- yeah, I'm sorry. I know it's it's <laughs> robbed me of something really important. Um, but no, and so now I'm at this like like I said this crossroads where I'm trying to figure out I can't be that guy anymore. Yeah. It's not empowering. I don't think it's empowering anymore. Yeah, to to come out and say that, especially because culturally, I think we the tide has really shifted for Asian men. I think we have like so many you know uh, Asian male sex symbols out there now yeah. that like you know, the conversation has changed a lot. And I think, you know, a lot of that material was a a direct response to seeing for so many years, no fast, no femmes, no Asians on Mm -hmm. dating profiles or different iterations of that. Mm -hmm. And do I think that it has changed dramatically? I don't know. I do think that guys on dating apps are now keeping some of that behind the curtain a little bit more, even if those preferences still exist. I think we've come to an agreement sort of as a community that, yes, everyone has preferences that maybe they may or may not be able to control or be unwilling to interrogate, but it, there's a way to present it that is not harmful to the people that are reading your profile. And so, you know, uh, if that's the case, it's just gone behind the curtain. I think that's still a net positive, even if the preferences hasn't, haven't necessarily changed. But yeah, I'm just like trying to figure out what is 
the most interesting version of myself to be on stage now. And it's, um, mm. you know, I'm slowly stumbling through and figuring it out, but it is not by any means. I'm not like, I will not be releasing another special anytime soon. So, you know, <laughs> while I figured it out. Yeah. You're giving yourself that space. Yeah. I mean, listen, it took me like that. six years to write the material that went into the, my Netflix special. Yeah. And I am not the kind of comedian that feels the need or urge to release a new special every year. Mm -hmm. There, are, I know plenty of comedians who do that. And I know plenty that do it successfully. And I know a lot who don't. <laughs> and I know yeah. myself well enough to know that I just need time to cook. And I would rather put out something that I'm proud of than just having something out there to, you know, for the sake of having it out there. You're the Adele of comedy. <laughs> that is, um, uh, yeah, I can't endorse that, but um, <laughs> thank you. I, you're welcome. I, I love knowing what's on limits and what's off limits mm -hmm. for each comedian. Like I've, you know, other friends who are comedians yeah. and I'm just like, I'm always so fascinated about like how they draw the line in their lives and knowing that it the line might evolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, for me, I am a very, I am, from the school of comedy that says anything is uh, is okay as long as it's funny, um, and I think that funny is funny to you or funny to the audience. Funny to the audience, okay. Ultimately, okay. Okay. because that's the thing is that like I, I've seen some really dark shit talked about and like some things. You know, anything can be made funny as long sure. as if the audience is laughing, then it were it's successful. Yeah. And I think um, a lot of comedians now want to sort of blame the audience and say they're too sensitive or they're too this or that. But it's like, if your joke was better, then it wouldn't matter. And is, is that in reference to something recently? No, oh, not necessarily. Okay. I think just generally, I think like, you know, comedians have been bitching about that since it was, you know, invented. So I, I, I don't think it's anything <laughs> since new. Since bitching was invented? Yeah. yeah. I, I generally stick, my rule yeah. of thumb is though, I do think it is generally more effective to punch up than down. And I think like it's, mm. I think people have a, a pretty innate sense of when that's happening versus like when you're punching down and oftentimes punching down the jokes that come from that are so hack and so old and so mm. uninteresting and usually the kind of joke that anyone could make. Mm -hmm. I think it's much more difficult to punch up um, successfully than it is to punch down successfully. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, I just, I, I, I hesitate to ever say like this topic is off limits because um, mm. it's so contextual too, you yeah. know, like a topic yeah. that's off limits for me that I might feel is off limits for me wouldn't be off limits to somebody else depending on the context of their life and yeah. their experience. And so, yeah, it's all contextual. I don't like to say, I don't like being super definitive about the rules of stand-up comedy because I think, you know, they're just so nebulous and can change depending on who the person is and who the audience is. And yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I think like we're in a really interesting spot right now with comedy because of course, like the more conservative comedians and maybe the more edgelordy comedians have been bemoaning clapter in left-leaning comedies. It's, it's when like, it's when a comedian comes out and says like, I support trans people. And then the audience claps and then there's no, real joke behind that oh. um and then but the thing is <laughs> the reverse is very much true clapter absolutely exists in more like right-leaning comedians i i can't tell you how many comedians i've seen come out here and say there are only two genders to uproarious applause from their right-leaning audience and it's like mm -hmm. that is conservative clapter like clapter. it's not something that is just uh localized to you know the left uh, progressive, you know, liberal elite comics. It is something that is plaguing comedians of all political stripes. And I think it's a concern. I think like, is it, is it like a cheap way to just get the yeah, rowdiness? Yeah, I think, no, like it's the, just like, I, I think some comedians are more concerned about being right than they are about being funny. Oh. And that is a problem. I think I would rather be sort of loud and wrong on purpose and funny mm -hmm. than um, just like coming out there and stating my ideals and, yeah. and getting applause for that. Like, you know, it'll happen, but it, I just think it's happening across the political spectrum right now. And mm -hmm. it, everything, you know, it's so polarizing right now. There are very few comics, I think, who have a lot of like universal crossover appeal mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because our culture is so polarized now yeah. and so team sportsy. 
you know, like that's what it yeah. is, is that, you know, it's just about like racking up points and against the other team at this point for some people. And um, mm. I would just rather be dumb and stupid and funny. <laughs> and listen, I am, I was at the forefront of like, quote unquote, like woke comedy at one point in my career. I think, mm. you know, like I, I'm not embarrassed about the early years of my career or certainly like the years where I was breaking, but so much of it was new. It felt new back then to talk about my identity in a certain way and it did feel you know sort of groundbreaking and now you know i think in the context of where we are at now as a culture it doesn't feel that groundbreaking to just go out and be like white people are like this and mm. you know asian people are like this yeah, yeah yeah and so that's the other thing is like trying to break out of that mindset and yeah. find new and interesting ways to talk about issues like that and and just like sort of backing away from talking about real shit in general because I, I just it's like it's so hard to escape the real shit in just everyday life yeah and so when you go to a, see a comedy show and there are many examples of people doing it well I think uh, there's a comedian Allison Leiby who has like an entire hour about abortion that is so funny and still manages to be poignant and yeah. and sort of uh you know she makes some points but I do think that like there are examples of people who go out and just should be doing motivational speaking not yeah stand up. Yeah. And I think there's been examples of big name comedians who are so fixated on again trans people that it just becomes again a podcast episode. Mm. You know, it's not it's just like so weird. It's like I watch some of these specials and I'm like where are the jokes? Like these are observations certainly about you know culture but yeah. like they're not funny. Yeah. Um and that is I think that's the biggest worry I think that we should all have as comedians is, mm. you know, how are we making the audience laugh or are we making the audience agree with us? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? I want to take a moment to give a loud shout out to The Embody Lab, which is ugh, one of the most incredible resources for body-based and somatic therapies. This show is all about healing and The Embody Lab does exactly that. Whether you're on your own journey of transformation and discovery or enhancing your skill sets in your career as like a coach or a therapist, a body worker, or really any career where you are supporting other gently used humans, the Embody Lab is your place for deep, inspiring, and impactful workshops, certificates, masterclasses, and an incredible community of like-minded folks. I love the Embody Lab, and so do so many other people that call it a platform to come home to over and over again. The Embody Lab is giving my listeners an exclusive offer, a one-time 10% off code to enhance your embodied well-being. All you have to do is go to theembodylab.com and use the code GENTLYUSE10 at checkout. So is what I'm hearing like somewhat that the the age of identity comedy is shifting? I think so. I I I, I hesitate to make any grand proclamations about sure. it. I think there are still comedians who are doing it well. I just think I personally exhausted every angle on that yeah. for myself yeah. in many ways. And it's no longer super creatively interesting for me to like dissect it from, mm. you know, every angle. I I I do think that we are sort of now moving beyond just the age of representation being enough. Yeah. And yeah. there needing to be more texture and more depth yeah. to it than just simply coming out and being, you know, talking about representational politics. And I, I don't know. I think it's good. It's an interesting time to try and be a comedian right now because mm -hmm. it, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle because look around, you know, the real stuff just does not seem funny. And I, and maybe escapism is a, a the wrong impulse to be leaning into, but sure. it's sort of where I'm at right now is I, I am so, I am such a serious person about a lot of these issues. I finding it more and more increasingly difficult to find the humor in conflict abroad or yeah. the, like, <laughs> um, you know, that would be a hard topic yeah. I think, to, to broach in the yeah. room of stand up. Or just like the general state of the world and politics yeah. and, you know, um, the crushing aspects of capitalism and things you, like that. Do you think this is why maybe some comedians are leaning more into observational yeah, work? Is I because think so. it's kind of hard to not 
I yeah. mean, it's kind of hard to be funny about fuck everything right now. Yeah, I mean, listen, I th- also think I know myself well enough to know that is just a higher degree of difficulty than I am interested in um, tackling mm. for myself right now. Sure. Or um, my general ability, my comedic voice is maybe not the one that is like most well equipped because, yeah. you know, I may like I am still coming out on stage um, as an idiot <laughs> um, most nights. And so uh, I'm making light of a lot of things and there yeah. are just things that it's like not easy for me to make light of. No. Um, but there are definitely comedians, I think, that have done it w- well in the past and like will continue to do well with it. It's just not something that I find very creatively interesting right now. Yeah. I want to circle back to kind of exhausting the identity deconstruction mm-hmm. and and performance of it. Because it, I think that that, I don't know, I can I can really relate to that in my own process of performance and mm-hmm. like getting tired of myself. Yeah. How did you recognize that? And what was the point of which you were like, okay, excavating, 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 performing, and just like, were you done excavating or what, what how did it emerge for you? Um, I think it was partially, it was the, the uh, how people were approaching me as a comedian and talking about me and my material. And I think the demands of it are very specific. Like I think, um, you know, I talk a lot of, I, I broach a lot of this in my Netflix special of just the demands of representation yeah. and the responsibility of it. Mm. And, you know, people bring a lot to you when you are heralded as some, you know, win for representation. Yeah. It just, it, it gets really frustrating when that's the sort of like first thing people sort of approach you to accomplish when it's like, mm. again, it should be the comedy first and then everything else is sort of set dressing. And I think I, you know, I'm very lucky that I broke when I did and I'm grateful for that. And, you know, I was on this sort of forefront of this new generation of queer comics too. Yeah. And I'm very proud of that. But I think um, I was, because I was an early one, it just like, it felt like I had to talk about it. Yeah. And I'm just like so happy for all of the young comics that I see coming up now, the people of color and the queer people yeah. that are able to just like do whatever they want and not have to necessarily frame everything um, from that point of view of through the lens of their identity. Mm-hmm. And um, they just allow it to be running in the background. And and that's what I'm trying to sort of move into as well. And, you know, I, I sort of painted myself into a corner by talking about it so much early in my career, but... Um, it's ex- it's interesting and it's sort of freeing to you know try and figure out how I can be a more specified specific version of myself on stage and not yeah. just be this vessel for representation. Yeah, because it's exhausting and it's like so boring to talk about continually. And yeah. it's like I don't know. I just think um, it's not that we've reached some level of parity, you know, culturally. Yeah. by any means, we still have a lot more to do and there's still many more conversations to have around representation i just don't think i am the appropriate vessel for it anymore and it's just not something that is interesting to me i think i've talked about it i've i've you know my my stances haven't changed that dramatically and it just gets frustrating when you walk into a room with an executive trying to sell a show and they are their immediate question is like how is this going to represent your community You know, how is this going to speak for your community? And it's like, that's not my goal. And that's not what anyone's goal should be primarily. But, you know, you get put into this box and that is what you become. And, um, you know, again, like I I literally wrote a movie that tackles a lot of these issues. So I I did this to myself. But were you kind of over this? aspect or this phase of your work when you had written the Fire Island movie? I think um, Fire Island for me was sort of putting a period on some of these discussions for me, you know, like it's, you know, desirability politics in the gay community was something that I've been, you know, thinking about since I was in my early twenties and since I started this career. And I think it was something that felt relevant um, for a lot of people and will continue to feel relevant for a lot of people. But do I think I need to continually dissect it and and rehash it in my next series of projects. No. Um, And do I think I'm the person that needs to be, that is best equipped to be continuing that conversation? Probably not. You know, like I think there's a lot of other angles that I am not equipped to, to, to to be the arbiter for anymore. And so 
I'm glad that I made Fire Island and I'm glad that it resonated with so many people and like a lot of people feel seen by it, but it is not something that I need to continue exploring in my work, at least not for now. And you know, it's interesting because the trap of representation is this, is that like for as many Asian men, gay men come up to me and say, oh my God, I've never felt so seen. Like Mm. if, you know, like this, it felt like this movie was for me. The people that probably hate the movie the most are gay Asian men sometimes, you know, like who, because imagine like you are told by the media or by, you know, whoever that like this movie is for you, this movie tells your story and then you see it. And if it doesn't, then of course you're going to react negatively to that. Um, and, and sort of overcorrect by vocalizing how much you hate it. Yeah. Sometimes to me, I will say no one is more willing to tell me how much they hate their movie, my movie rather, uh, than a drunk gay guy. <laughs> it's it's wild. It's yeah. the, it's incredible the amount of notes I've gotten about a movie that is locked and released. Um, <laughs> As if it could crazy. be edited. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, is it the mirror aspect I, of like, I mean, for me, when I, I, I actually saw your movie in Fire Island, oh, really? I waited to see it there. That's so funny. <laughs> One of the aspects that I really appreciated, I was like, oh, this is like the mean girls of <laughs> <laughs> comedy. And I was like, finally. Like it was, there was a way in which there was, it, it, it just shone the light on the fact of like the, ugh, so many, so many in-group fighting mm-hmm. issues when, and I, and I kind of hear that, like as you're giving, getting feedback from gay men yeah. around a movie that's supposed to be representational and supportive, or is I found it? Yeah, I mean, this is the thing, and this yeah. was always the goal: is that you will ne- you have, you will never catch me, and nor do I think there's any recorded evidence of me going out there and saying this represents the entire community. No. You know, like I was always very intentional in the way that I spoke about it, saying yeah. like this is a very personal story. Yeah, this is a very personal story about specifically Bowen and I's friendship, and yeah. like the things that we have dealt with together, yeah. and the ways that we struggle differently yeah. and like it was always supposed to be like if you see yourself reflected in that specificity yeah then great yeah. in it but like by no means was i trying to say like this is the every angle on the gay community every representing every corner of our community it's just not something that i was able uh, no. anyone could do and no. i think like you'd be a fool to try did people feel left out mm, i think there are definitely people that felt left out. I think I got a lot of criticism from people who didn't think that, you know, the body diversity of the movie went far enough, that the racial diversity, yeah, racial diversity didn't go far enough, different, you know, aspects of of different corners of the community that that didn't feel served. You know, uh, Tomas is non-binary, but, you know, I know that other people were sort of like, where was the trans representation? And I, I oh, get I get that frustration, especially as the movie was sort of, you know, a lot of people did say like, oh, this is like really interesting representation of the community, a really diverse representation of the community. I was celebrated for the diversity in the casting a lot of times. And I think people saw that and sort of like got mad because they were, didn't see, didn't feel it was enough. But I will say it, this is yeah. that, I, I hope my what my movie did is open the door for more people to tell different kinds of stories yeah. about those corners of the queer community yeah. because I don't think anyone needs me to be telling a trans person's story mm. of their experience of Fire Island because yeah. I, you know, I have many trans friends that go to Fire Island, yeah. but I don't know the ins and outs of, you yeah, know, yeah. their, the complication of that yeah. experience for them. Yeah. And I don't, and I think if I tried to, I would do a huge disservice yeah. to that community. And I, and I think like people would then be mad that I, tr- you know, like tried and like, there's, it's, it's, it's a fine line to yeah. walk between like telling their story and including them in the narrative. Yeah. And um, I intentionally set out to make a gay Asian story and yeah. tell it gay Asian um narrative in my movie because that's the one that I felt best equipped to tell. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I I I don't know. I think like again, ultimately I hope that the movie opened doors to get more because that is ultimately the problem with a lot of uh, media that is heralded as representational is that yeah. you know, especially I think in gay media, we get so few that like when looking is the only show on television yeah. f- aimed at us yeah. and it leaves out a significant portion of us, then of course it's going to be 
it's going to get flack. Whereas with yeah. straight people, they see a show that's not for them and they say, oh, okay, move on to the other scores and scores yeah. and scores of shows yeah. that are for me. Yeah. Whereas we are sort of left with this decision to make where it's like, okay, this doesn't really speak to me or my experience, but it's also the closest maybe and yeah. the only option that I have. And that yeah. breeds a lot of resentment that I yeah. understand completely because listen, I actually really, I do think looking is, is good, but was I a little bitch about it on Twitter back in the day. I'm sure I was. In fact, I know I was. And like, yeah. and it's, it's that thing of, of like, we just don't get enough of it and we should be demanding more. And like, yeah. we should be supporting people that are telling different kinds of stories, not just the same like cis white story yeah. over and over and over again, or, you know, cis white Asian story or what have you. Like, I yeah. just like, you know, we need to be finding those people that can tell those stories and supporting them and getting them through the door. And then, you know, I'm, I'm really torn on the question of like, should we as gay people unilaterally support every single piece of gay media just because we there's that fear and that threat yeah. of if this doesn't pop off and if this isn't successful, we'll never get another one. Yeah. I, I, it's a really tough argument to make to some people. I, and I get, I understand the impulse to do that. Like, yeah, I went and saw Love, Simon. I'm not a child though. It wasn't for me, yeah, yeah. you know? And like, but I knew the, what was that sort of at stake at that point. But I, I also don't know that I, it's something that I want to ask people to do. And it doesn't feel good as a creator to come at it from that angle either. Like, I don't yeah. want to guilt people into seeing my movie. <laughs> like, it's just not something I'm interested in doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not the, the best approach no. to entertainment. Yeah. I really appreciate you unpacking the nuance and the complexities of all this because it, it on, on surface level, it looks, it, it appears as one way and it's actually incredibly more nuanced and complex. Yeah. And I think you, you unpack that brilliantly, by the way. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, it's just, I think people think I have a very inflated sense of importance about making that movie and, Mm. I like assume I have some ego about that. And, you know, it is, it's really funny. You know, if they're not straight up telling me that they didn't like the movie, I, a lot of gay guys really feel the need to neg me before giving me a compliment about the movie, which is, I think because they have that assumption that I need to be brought down a little bit before they can just <laughs> give me a compliment. Like the number of times a guy has come up to me and said um, some version of, you know, I don't care what anyone else says. I actually really liked your movie. It was <laughs> crazy scott well, it is insane me. and i'm like so constantly like you can just say nothing actually like nothing you can, is beautiful you can really just say nothing like i don't need that i don't yeah. need a compliment i don't need a note i don't like it is i don't need to hear how somebody didn't like the movie like the, i i constantly like the I, I remember them when the movie came out like people would make this habit of being like oh my god girl they're dragging you online but don't worry i'm in the comments defending you and then pulling up like shitty tweets or like facebook Fuck. comments or threads of people trashing the movie and to show me that they were there defending me and i was like I actually have no desire to know that this exists. That's um, a little too much for trauma. my mental health, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that is, I think, wow. the way that certain people in our community react to like gay, quote unquote, like gay famous people. Mm -hmm. And like, I do think that there is this assumption, like people get mad when you think you are important. Yeah. People get really mad when you think you're important. And it's like, meanwhile, you have no idea how unimportant I, guess I think I am <laughs> and like how riddled with insecurity I already am. You do not need to help me get there. Like, trust me, anything like shitty you have to say about me or my work, I have already thought it a thousand times. Yeah. Yeah. I think if people would just sort of step back and realize like, just because someone else referred to me as a celebrity does not mean that's how I view myself, sure. yeah. you know? And I think people get really sort of like this desire to sort of like bring people down a peg or like, you know, humble them it's like some of us don't require that. We're doing that work on our own. But yeah, I think that, yeah, people get really upset and angry when they assume that someone thinks they're more important than they are. Yeah. And typically it's a reflection of their own insecurity sure, that they're yeah. projecting on other people. I know. I'm feeling doing guilty the of that too. I mean, absolutely. I, you know, You're doing when that I was in a different, right <laughs> 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 when I've been in different places in my, you yeah. know, in, my career or whatever, like I, I definitely have probably said that about other people or tweeted that about other people. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a saint by any means in that regard. Yeah. But I also, you know, 
I understand it. I understand yeah. the impulse and why it's where it's coming from. And then some people just won't like you. And that's something that I've had to really grapple with. <laughs> <laughs> you have quite the subversive tweet history. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I'm a, I, I, I have tended to pop off in ways I would never pop off in real life online. The social uh, avatar gives certain permissions yeah, that we yeah, don't yeah, have yeah, in real yeah, life. For sure. for sure. I mean, I tend to, I try to pick my targets judiciously. Um, but <laughs> especially I think when Twitter was like, you know, in its golden era and yeah. I was a nobody, yeah. you feel really, yeah. uh, you know, like it's open season and you don't think anyone's going to see it or care or, yeah. but now I'm, I'm much, I, I like to think I'm a little bit more thoughtful about it than I, than I used to be. Quid check your tweet history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because you feel like there could be more whiplash or just because you've grown up? I certain- think I've just grown up. And yeah. I think I, I have a lot more understanding sort of being on the other side of like people not really seeing you as a human being anymore and just seeing uh, you as like a figure yeah. or like an idea. Yeah. Like, cause I, people will send me the wildest DMs all the time. Um, and I don't, uh, you know, I'm not checking every day, but like I'll go through cause sometimes, you know, like legit things will come in yeah, yeah. through DMs and, and, Sometimes I have a very strict do not engage policy with most people, whether it's yep. people in my mentions on Twitter or people in my DMs yeah. on Instagram. Um, but every time I break that rule and I do say like, you know, I remember somebody said something really shitty to me a couple of weeks ago and I just sent back, it was late and I was probably fucked up, but I was just like, what was your goal? Like, how did you Such want me to respond to this? What did you hope to accomplish with this message? And almost 90, I would say 90% of the time that I do actually respond yeah. to someone's shitty message, they immediately go, oh my God, I had no idea that you were going to see this. I'm actually such a huge fan. Like, I love you. I love your work. It is such, it's it really? is crazy whiplash. And it's, again, they do not assume I am going to a see it or that I will be affected by it or that I am a human being in general. Uh, and I get that because like, Oh my God, I, I'm a, sh- I'm a, a snarky gay guy online. The number of things I've said about real housewives, yeah, you know, because they are not real to me yeah, is insane. So yeah. I'm, I'm a, a absolute hypocrite, but like the more it happens to me, the more I think I do tend to like, you know, are you saying you know empathize with the real housewives? Uh, well, I would go that far. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think like, I think I've just grown to be like, you know, I can keep some of this to the group chat. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It doesn't need to be out there for everyone to see, certainly not for the people it's about to see. Like, yeah. you're going to have opinions about people and they might be fair or unfair, but I've definitely been grown to be a little bit more judicious about like which platform I'm using yeah. to share those thoughts and, and ideas. Yeah. Because, yeah, I get, uh, you know, it's something that has happened to me and if, you know, you won't get it sometimes until you're in that position yourself. Yeah. I wish for everyone to be a celebrity. Yeah. So that they... <laughs> um, I mean, it's like, the, the thing is, is <laughs> it is like people ask me all the time, like when they see someone come up to me at a bar or a party or something yeah. like that and like say something, uh, they're always like, oh, is this annoying for you? And I'm like, listen, this is brand new for me and mm. I have no idea how much longer it's going to last. So I welcome it with That's open really arms. Like if people want to chat, I mean, sometimes yeah. they're, you know, people go a little far or like are a little too, yeah. like maybe drunk to <laughs> be having a conversation <laughs> with. And that's usually when I need to be rescued or something or excuse yeah. myself. But for the most part, people are really nice and cool and like they just want to say hi. And I again, like who knows how much longer that will happen for me. So I'm going to, you know, accept it and like be grateful for it now. But the the reverse, I think that like a lot of people don't think about is that for as many people come up to me and say like nice things to me, there are as many, if not more people that I see at these like gay parties. I've gotten really adept at seeing people mouth my name to their friend and then roll their eyes or something like that. And it is difficult to know that you're at a party and there are a segment of that party hates your guts and has and does not know you. Yeah, it does not. You know, and it's a, such a mind fuck. And it, you know, has not, it has, certainly hasn't ruined the parties for me. I still go and I still have Good. a fucking blast and I'm, you know, doing whatever I need to do to dissociate um, from <laughs> uh, any of the, the insecurity I might have about being there. But yeah, it does sort of like, I don't know, there, it's like you don't 
like no one would like going to a party knowing that there are a bunch of people there who think you're cringe or hate you or yeah you know have ideas about you based on very little and so it does it has affected the way i act at certain things yeah. and yeah it's just um i'm never going to complain about the amount of success that i have achieved in my career thus far I'm so grateful and so lucky and I cannot emphasize that enough that so much of it is luck. Mm. Um, but, you know, it doesn't come without little mind fucks here yeah. and there. This show is also brought to you by the absolutely stunning and powerful tools of transformation that are created by Omala. Oof, even the name Omala transports you to a place of flow and vitality. These are some of my favorite products ever. They have an amazing color-changing yoga mat that responds to your temperature and presence and reflects back your posture in real time. There's this incredible smelling skin balm candle that heats up to activate all the essential oils and vitamins that your skin has been craving. I mean, look, if I could live in a giant bath of this candle, I would 100% do it. They also have these journals that lead you into profound insight, and then you get to plant those journals to create a stunning flower garden. What? I mean, if that's not deep and inventive, I don't know what is. If you're someone who desires to live a luxurious flow of life and who believes in transformative wellness, then you have to check out Omala. Omala is giving my listeners an exclusive discount to treat yourself to something that is as special as you, boo. All you have to do is go to omala.com, that's O-M-A-L-A.com, and use the code DRSCOTT10 at checkout. And a portion of every purchase goes to an incredible charity. You got this. Any other mind fucks we should know about? Mm, I think like I love the transparency of this yeah. because I, I think it it helps. Listen, like yeah. I think a lot of people I get a lot of flack online for my uh, having a white partner, and that is not something that I ever expected to have to deal with so publicly or wow. feel like I have to sort of protect my relationship a little bit because I don't you know, there's a certain level of scrutiny that becomes a little weird to me and a lot of assumptions that go into it, I think. Yeah. And that's been difficult because, you know, I don't post about my partner yep. very much at all. And luckily he does not give a shit about that. Yeah. Thank God he's not an Instagram person. So he yeah. doesn't, he, he checks it like three times a year and does not care if I post pictures of him. Love that. Um, which is, yeah, lucky for me and, yeah. and um, convenient considering the situation. But yeah, it's weird to like be a, like stressed out about talking or posting photos of you, the person that you love the most in this world, yeah. because you know, people are going to be shitty about it. And, you know, that's just, I get it. I understand why it's problematic for people. And, but at the end of the day, like I, a never imagined that I would end up with a white guy. Um, mm. And B, I just think it's, I don't know, like, there are, we make up what, like 6% of the population of the world. The chances of you finding someone that you, that sees you and you see them and you connect and love each other and like jive and feel safe around. It's like um, pretty slim yeah. for many people. Yeah. And the fact that I found him, um, I feel so grateful for. Mm. And I ultimately had this decision to make. I mean, the third question I asked him on the dance floor when we met was, so are you like fully white? <laughs> um, and he was like, yeah, unfortunately I am. Unfortunately uh, yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was like, wow. And I jokingly said this, had no idea he was going to be more than just a one night stand at this yeah. point. And I was like, wow, Twitter's going to be really mad at me. <laughs> and I was right. They are. And, um, Back but, the, the, fuck off, but the thing is, is that like, I, <laughs> yeah. I had this decision to make when we were falling in love where I was yeah. like, I know this is going to be difficult because I am in the, um, public eye to some extent yeah. and there will be a lot of scrutiny about our relationship because of the interracial nature of it yeah and you know people have called me a white worshiper or that i only chase white men or that oh i only God. care about white men or that i prioritize white men or that i'm white uh, you know i'm seeking some sort of white adjacency because of this relationship and the fact is is that like it's so not something 
that comes up and I, I just like, I hope that they never, you know, I don't know. It, it's just, that part is difficult for me. And it, and, um, mm. it was a really, it almost ended the relationship before it began. Yeah. Um, because I knew how difficult it would be, um, at times, oh. but the relationship itself makes up for it. And I'm, Good. you know, it's a champagne problem. Yeah. Ultimately like yeah. that people give me shit for it. Um, but He's Italian, so I, it was so funny. I was in New York recently, and I was talking to this uh, guy. He was a, a fellow person of color, and he yeah. saw a picture of my boyfriend on my phone, and he was like, "Oh, thank God, he's not white." And I was like, oh, "Unfortunately," yes. <laughs> and I was like, "But he is Italian." And this guy, so like full of grace, was just like, "Well, that's something." <laughs> I was like, "Is it? Is it anymore?" I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, it's just like I uh, the level of scrutiny on different areas of my life is just so uncomfortable. Yeah. And again, it's why I think I've become even more introverted and more private mm. as time has gone on. That makes sense as to why some of the evolution has changed mm -hmm. in your work and your ideology and yeah. your perspective of comedy. Speaking of, mm -hmm. you ready to do our game? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So we created a, a game for you because I actually love how on your podcast mm -hmm. you had been giving you were like an advice guru yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I love the way that you did it mm -hmm. and um, you know as as a therapist you're sort of restricted to the way you give advice or not give advice at all so in this show I get to say fuck that yeah. and we get to say some crazy shit in response to some uh, wildly interesting uh, requests mm -hmm. <laughs> so we asked our viewers for <laughs> um, if they were to ask you for advice Okay. Uh, what they would ask for advice on. And I have to say, I have some delightfully strange okay, folks cool. that uh, that we are connected wow. <laughs> to the show on. So first, first question for advice is um, from Allie. And they, uh, Allie said, my partner's dog really likes to watch us have sex. Uh, I really care about my partner and the dog, but I don't know if this is healthy. Am I harming the dog by letting him watch? I think that, much damage has been done over the, um, the last several decades of dog-focused media. Um, mm. So many projections of personality and humanity onto pets. Like, there are too many movies about dogs. Quite frankly, there are more <laughs> movies. There are more movies that star dogs than Asian men um, in America. Is right? that true? No, I don't know if that's true, <laughs> but it feels that way, right? I don't know. It just feels that way. I mean, lately, and, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think you are overthinking this. I do not think that your dog knows really if you're even alive half the time. And as long as you're feeding it and giving it shelter and taking it for walks, I don't think you need to ultimately worry. Um, the dog doesn't know what's going on. It doesn't understand and um, is not gonna remember it probably in a few moments after it's done seeing you. Yeah, I think we just need to maybe like take a step back from like projecting any sort of emotional yeah. response on our pets sometimes because they're quite dumb. Um, <laughs> You know, it's They're cool. Like it's, it's cool that they can like sense when you're about to have a stroke, but I don't think that like they are, uh, you know, easily traumatized by seeing sex. Yeah, I, I don't know. I could be wrong. I'm not an expert, but I'm gonna give my opinion as though I am. I mean, I appreciate that. Yeah, I re yeah. That question strangely reminds me of Best in Show. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think we should call Parker Posey right mm -hmm. now and just ask for her advice on the same yeah. question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I haven't seen all these questions yet, but I'm, um, I'm laughing at this one in advance. I love hosting dinner parties, but my friend Chrissy is a food influencer and critiques every meal. How do I tell them to enjoy the food without the commentary or should I just start serving them peanut butter and jelly as a culinary critique? I think that there are, are sort of like little ways to train people on this. And it's a it's a very easy, simple punishment and reward system. Um, Some Pavlovian shit. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think like every time she says something shitty or critical, um, you you have to then say something shitty and critical about what she's wearing. Oh, um, an eye for an eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it. And then yeah. <laughs> slowly over time, I think she'll start to associate her own criticism with feeling bad about herself mm. and she might change again um deeply toxic uh, deeply toxic not great advice but it is the sort of chaotic energy that i think people need to embrace a little bit more 
um, with people who are overly critical. I don't think we get enough toxic advice. I mean, the whole Goldilocks of like advice on Instagram yeah, right now, no. it's like, it's not balanced. Mm -mm. We, you know, the balance of some toxic shit. Thank mm -hmm. you for, thank you for balancing the world out. I try. Thank you for creating harmony. Oh, okay. My parrot has always copied things I've said, but it used to just be a few phases of uh, phrases of mine. Now it started mimicking my laugh and it feels hurtful. What should I do? I mean, again, this is a case of I think you are projecting intent on an animal that has none. Mm -hmm. um, birds famously very stupid, you know, except for crows, I guess, which don't get me started. But um, your first mistake was getting a bird in the first place. I think maybe this rec this is a moment for you to be a little more introspective about maybe your laugh is bad, mm. you know, and maybe again, it's that mirroring thing of yeah. like you're seeing it's something. It's literally parroting back. Yeah. And yeah. you... Um, you're reacting to it because you recognize the truth of it. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, you know, look inward instead of blaming the bird outright. Oh yeah, I agree. How would you change your laugh? I mean, we're gay men. We are used to modulating <laughs> our responses, our like, vocal, <laughs> vocal responses. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. So like, yeah. Um, for me, that just seems like a, a completely natural thing to do, mm, <laughs> to, mm. depending on who you're around and with yeah. um, com completely changing uh, everything about your personality and affect. So yeah, take, take, be more gay, I guess. Be more gay. Um, in that regard. Wow, go for it. Uh, that, that was by uh, Melissa, by the way. Okay, so yeah, Melissa. <laughs> be more gay. Be more gay. There you have it. All right, last one. <laughs> um, I accidentally started a cold war with my partner over who can replace the toilet paper, paper roll in the most passive aggressive manner. Uh, how do we come to a truce without actually talking about it. I love this question. Um, I mean, you know, like many wars, like someone has to lose eventually. And, you know, and the winner sort of sets the terms um, for how you move forward. Mm. Um, you know, who gets annexed and who doesn't and mm. uh, new, you know, lines and things like that. I mm. think, um, you know, conventional wisdom would probably be like, you know, talk about it, be honest. And that is, you know, I've done that before, but I, it's much more fun to escalate <laughs> than it is to uh, just talk about your feelings openly. So I think um, you just have to uh, be smarter yeah. than them. Yeah. Um, be more ruthless than yeah. they are. And Record really it. divorce your feelings yeah. Yeah. for your partner from the actual conflict at hand. You yeah. know, like you can't go into a war no. loving the person that you're at war with. You no. have to really compartmentalize and remember that they are not a your partner, yeah, they are your enemy, yeah. In this, in this instance, in this, you know, sort paper of situation. corner of yeah. your life, and yeah. again, it's a, such a low stakes conflict. Yeah, that you can have fun with it. I think you so. You know, like that's when low stake conflict is like when you can really be toxic and 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 crazy. Yeah, um, because it ultimately doesn't matter yeah. who wins or loses this war. Yeah. It's just such a silly thing. But you want to win. You yeah. know, that's the thing. You have to really check in with yourself and ask yourself. Do you want to win? Yeah. Do you want to do what it's going to take to win? Yeah. And I don't, I, you know, I need much more specifics about their living situation to really give them specific advice on how yeah. to, how to be a real asshole about the toilet paper. But I think making sure that you know their pooping schedule is, mm. is paramount. Mm. So, so you, yes. yeah, you can't go into a war without having, you know, a dossier on your opponent. Um, so I think that's where I would start is locking down their pooping schedule, maybe mm -hmm. slipping some pure for men into their food so that it increases mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and um, making sure that there's no toilet paper in there oh when God. they go in. Ruthless, yeah. ruthless. Joel, thank you for being on the gym. <laughs> You've human and helping so many of yeah, us all over the world. <laughs> You're the best. And where can people find more of you? What's coming up that people can check um, out? If you have listeners in Melbourne, Australia, I'll be... We do, actually. Okay, great. Then I'll be at the Melbourne Comedy Festival. I think like that's the big one. Loot Season 2 comes out on Apple TV+. Plus, and you can watch you know, Fire Island on Hulu or 
Psychosexual, my Netflix special on Netflix. Amazing. And um, I'm on Twitter still, on, uh, ill-advisedly, uh, <laughs> at IHLKim. Um, that's my handle on Instagram and Twitter. I'm leaving Twitter very soon, though. It's uh, the final countdown for sure. Countdown. I'm going to start a sub stack where I talk about reality television. Oh. Because that's the only joy that Twitter brings me anymore, is okay. connecting with people about the traders or the housewives or drag race or something like that. Yeah. And I'm just going to like condense all of those, what would be individual tweets into some thoughts. And like then, a novel? No, not a full novel but oh. the, just like a place where i can go and like talk to strangers about my thoughts on reality tv because that's the only thing that that website really brings me anymore is is that the opportunity to connect with uh similarly brain dead people so <laughs> you gotta have an audience somewhere yeah, exactly <laughs> amazing all right everyone follow joel and see all his incredible comedy and shows and movies and uh, we will catch up with you soon, my gently used human friends. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Gently Used Human podcast with Dr. Scott Lyons and friends. Visit GentlyUsed.com for fun extras, including submitting your questions for advice from a Midwestern mom. And don't forget to spill the tea and gossip about the show with all your friends and frenemies. And you know what? Show us some love by giving us five stars and leaving a review in your favorite apps. This helps us connect with all the other gently used humans out there. Oh, and by the way, you look fierce today. <laughs>